Well, I hope everyone is staying cool now that the hot weather has picked back up again with a bang. Weekend was certainly nice with temperatures down in the 60s and 70s. Hopefully we'll get some of that again in the near future, but uh, certainly hot today. One of the books that I'll be using this evening is this book, Celtic Daily Prayer. There's a an intentional community, so people that gather together for communal life. Uh, you can see it down by my finger here, the Northumbria community in England. Not a place that I've visited, but I do enjoy their worship book. Uh, it is, as you would expect, different worship services throughout the day. The bulk of it is made up of cycles of readings for the year, kind of their lectionary. There are two different tracks for that. Uh, but what is also interesting about this is the introduction by a man named Richard Foster, who is uh, a friend or a Quaker here in the United States. Foster wrote a book around 1980 that was really powerful, The Celebration of Discipline, in which he brought uh, ancient spiritual practices like fasting and contemplative prayer, things like that, more into the mainstream. He wrote a whole book about how to bring those ancient practices back to enhance your prayer life. Foster's got a lot of good stuff out there. So it says a lot that he put his stamp on that book, but I'll use some of their prayers. It's Celtic based. So some of it is contemporary Celtic stuff uh, and some of it draws on ancient, ancient liturgy. Since we were uh, celebrating a Welsh saint yesterday, Govan, who lived 1600, no, 6th century, 1500 years ago, yesterday. want to bring some more of that in this week. All right, well, it's good to see you all. Hey, Nashville, good to see you. Kathy Kay, Jenny Fox, great to see you all. Jim King's texting me with something about advertising, so Jenny Fox, the man's thinking. All right, let's get started with evening prayer. Uh, we are on page 63 tonight for evening prayer, right one. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Page 64, the Phos Hilaron, please pray with me. O gracious light, pure brightness of the ever-living Father in heaven, O Jesus Christ, holy and blessed, now as we come to the setting of the sun and our eyes behold the vesper light, we sing thy praises, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Thou art worthy at all times to be praised by happy voices, O Son of God, O giver of life, and to be glorified through all the worlds. Our psalm for this evening begins on page 722. We're doing Psalm 94. Since we're talking about, hey Rev, since we're talking about Celtic traditions in our particular branch of Christianity, the Psalms are particularly loved in the Celtic tradition, which is why we have them with every service. And then also the Gospel of John and the tradition around that. So the three letters that John wrote, and even the book of Revelation, which also comes out of that tradition. We don't understand some of it. Uh, a lot of images that made sense to John and perhaps to his community, but that meaning's been lost to us. But the ultimate point, that at the end of whatever comes through life, that we worship a God who is there, who meets us at the end, who wipes away every tear from our eyes, those are the things that our Celtic tradition celebrates. So the Gospel of John and John's tradition within the New Testament, and then the Psalms as well, are particularly beloved by that community. And so we have a good one tonight, Psalm 94. And tomorrow at midday worship, we'll be looking at Psalm 119, a piece of that. I'm writing about it this week in the e-weekly as well. So we'll get some extra Psalm time this week. It's good, rich stuff. but. Again, page 722, Psalm 94, please join me. We'll read in unison. The Lord God of vengeance, O God of vengeance, show yourself. Rise up, O judge of the world. Give the arrogant their just deserts. 
How long shall the wicked, O Lord, how long shall the wicked triumph? They bluster in their insolence. All evildoers are full of boasting. They crush your people, O Lord, and afflict your chosen nation. They murder the widow and the stranger and put the orphans to death. Yet they say, the Lord does not see. The God of Jacob takes no notice. Consider well, you dullards among the people. When will you fools understand? He that planted the ear, does he not hear? He that formed the eye, does he not see? He who admonishes the nations, will he not punish? He who teaches all the world, has he no knowledge? The Lord knows our human thoughts. How like a puff of wind they are. Happy are they whom you instruct, O Lord, whom you teach out of your law, to give them rest in evil days until a pit is dug for the wicked. And the Lord will not abandon his people, nor will he forsake his own. For judgment will again be just, and all the true of heart will follow it. Who rose up for me against the wicked? Who took my part against the evildoers? If the Lord had not come to my help, I should soon have dwelt in the land of silence. As often as I said, my foot has slipped, your love, O Lord, upheld me. When many cares fill my mind, your consolations cheer my soul. Can a corrupt tribunal have any part with you, one which frames evil into law? They conspire against the life of the just and condemn the innocent to death. But the Lord has become my stronghold, and my God, the rock of my trust. He will turn their wickedness back upon them and destroy them in their own malice. The Lord our God will destroy them. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. All right, so our lesson for last evening came from the book of First Samuel. It was about the Hebrew Ark of the Covenant being captured by an enemy people, the Philistines, and they brought it into one of their temples. And the, the statue of their god named Dagon fell down in front of the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant, and they would set it back in its place, and the next day they would come in, and it fell down, and its limbs were all broken off. So they moved the Ark to another city, and there were plagues and problems following it. So we're going to continue that tradition tonight. This is uh, chapter 6 of First Samuel. After the chest of God had been among the Philistine people for seven months, the Philistine leaders called together their religious professionals, the priests and experts on the supernatural, for consultation. How can we get rid of this chest of God, get it off our hands without making things worse? Tell us. They said, if you're going to send the chest of the God of Israel back, don't just dump it on them. Pay compensation, then you will be healed. After you're in the clear again, God will let up on you. Why wouldn't he? And what exactly would make for adequate compensation? Five gold tumors and five gold rats, they said, to match the number of Philistine leaders. Since all of you, leaders and people, suffered the same plague, Make replicas of the tumors and rats that are devastating the country and present them as an offering to the glory of the God of Israel. Then maybe he'll ease up and not be so hard on you and your gods and on your country. Why be stubborn like the Egyptians and Pharaoh? God didn't quit pounding on them until they let the people go. Only then did he let up. So here's what you do. Take a brand new ox cart and two cows that have never been in harness Pitch the cows to the ox cart and send their calves back to the barn. With the chest of God on the cart, secure the gold replicas of the tumors and rats that you are offering as compensation in a sack. Set them next to the chest and send it off, but keep your eyes on it. If it heads straight back home to where it came from, toward Beth Shemesh, it is clear that this catastrophe is a divine judgment. But if not, we'll know that God had nothing to do with it. It was just an accident. So that's what they did. They hitched two cows to the cart, put their calves in the barn, and placed the chest of God and the sack of gold rats and tumors on the cart. The cows headed straight for home down the road to Beth Shemesh, straying neither right nor left, mooing all the way. Philistine leaders followed them to the outskirts of Beth Shemesh. The people were harvesting wheat in the valley. They looked up and saw the chest. Elated, they ran to meet it. The cart came into the field of Joshua, and stopped there beside a huge boulder. 
The harvesters tore the cart to pieces, chopped up the wood, and sacrificed the cows as a burnt offering to God. The Levites took charge of the chest of God and the sack containing the gold offerings, placing them on the boulder. Offering the sacrifices, everyone in Bet Shemesh worshipped God most heartily that day. When the five Philistine leaders saw what they came to see, they returned the same day to Ekron. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So interestingly, like I said last evening, archaeologists believe that the Philistines, and we found a lot of evidence of their cities and, and their culture, were Greek settlers that may have come over from Cyprus. Uh, and uh, this is an interesting practice, too. In Greek temples, a lot of times, if you had a physical ailment, um, a tumor, uh, or any number of things, Often what people would do is they would have a replica made of their problem and they would offer that as an offering in the temple and then you would go sleep in the temple and hope that the God gave you a dream or spoke to you in some way to tell you how to remedy that particular problem. So what we see in this passage would have been pretty common in Greek culture at different times and places to deal with the unknown. Interesting stuff. All right, so our canticle this evening is canticle number eight, which is found on page 85. Page 85, canticle number eight. Please join me when you get there. Hey, Bowling Green, good to see you. I'm trying to imagine what that would be like today if we still followed that practice, if we had little images made out of gold or silver or whatever you could afford of our problems and, and stored them somewhere in a sacred space. I'm trying to imagine what the church would look like full of stuff like that. Can you ever get rid of it? Or is that a sacrilege of some kind? I don't know. Rooms and rooms filled with stuff. Page 85, Canticle 8. Please read with me. I will sing to the Lord, for he is lofty and uplifted. The horse and its rider has he hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my refuge. The Lord has become my savior. This is my God, and I will praise him, the God of my people, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a mighty warrior. Yahweh is his name. The chariots of Pharaoh and his army has he hurled into the sea. The finest of those who bear armor have been drowned in the Red Sea. The fathomless deep has overwhelmed them. They sank into the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, is glorious in might. Your right hand, O Lord, has overthrown the enemy. Who can be compared with you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, glorious in holiness, awesome in renown, and worker of wonders? You stretched forth your right hand. The earth swallowed them up. With your constant love, you led the people you redeemed. With your might, you brought them in safety to your holy dwelling. You will bring them in and plant them on the mount of your possession. The resting place you have made for yourself, O Lord, the sanctuary, O Lord, that your hand has established. The Lord shall reign forever and forever. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Then we turn back. Pardon me, back to page 66 for the Apostles' Creed. So if you take nothing away from evening worship tonight, you've got rats and tumors made in gold. You can wow and delight your friends with that. Send them an email and tell them all about it. Rats and tumors. As we poke around in corners of Scripture that normally don't get preached on, all right, page 66, the Apostles' Creed, please join me. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. 
and on the next page. Dear friends, the Lord be with you and with thy spirit. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against them. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And on the next page, we'll pray suffrages B together. That this evening may be holy, good, and peaceful, we entreat thee, O Lord. That thy holy angels may lead us in paths of peace and goodwill, we entreat thee, O Lord. That we may be pardoned and forgiven for our sins and offenses, we entreat thee, O Lord. That there may be peace to thy church and to the whole world, we entreat thee, O Lord. That we may depart this life in thy faith and fear and not be condemned before the great judgment seat of Christ, we entreat thee, O Lord. That we may be bound together by thy Holy Spirit in the communion of all thy saints, trusting one another and all our life to Christ, we entreat thee, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech thee, make us to have a perpetual fear and love of thy holy name. For thou never failest to help and govern those whom thou hast set upon the sure foundation of thy loving kindness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. bottom of page 69 is a collect for peace. Please pray with me. <clears throat> o God, from whom all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works do proceed, give unto thy servants that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey thy commandments, and also that by thee, we being defended from the fear of all enemies, may pass our time in rest and quietness through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Like I said, I'm going to offer a prayer or two from this book. And this, delightfully enough, is a prayer for sleepless nights. <clears throat> the sky is bright with uncountable stars. I know they are uncountable. I have tried this impossible task, these sleepless nights. Where are you, Lord, as the fog of fatigue numbs me of all but the desperate desire to sleep? Comfort me, Lord, with your presence, as the ever-watchful mother soothes the fretful, feverish child. Grant me the gift of sleep and be the guardian of my dreams, that I may know you through them also. Or if I must watch with you through the long, hard night, share with me the burden of your heart, that my sleepless hours be spent in purposeful prayer. And if you bless me once more with the gift of the morning, may I rise grateful to you, ready to walk with you into the tasks of the day. Amen. O God, who dost manifest in thy servants the signs of thy presence, send forth upon us the spirit of love, that in companionship with one another thine abounding grace may increase among us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. This time I invite your thanksgivings and the intercession silently, aloud, or typed in the chat box. Amen. All right, page 72 is our final prayer. <clears throat> Pardon me. Page 72, the prayer of St. Chrysostom. Almighty God, 
who hast given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication unto thee, and hast promised to thy well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, thou wilt be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, the desires and petitions of thy servants as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of thy truth, and in the world to come life everlasting. Amen. Dear friends, let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. And I'll offer a final blessing, once again from this book. See that ye be at peace among yourselves and love one another. Follow the example of good folk of old, and God will comfort you and help you, both in this world and in the world which is to come. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As always, dear friends, it is a blessing to walk and worship with you. Uh, look at over the comments and the prayers that you all are offering. Hope you have a blessed evening, that you can stay cool in this heat. Let's see, tomorrow, Wednesday, we've got midday worship at 1 o'clock in the church. Uh, 5.30, we have our continuing study of the Baha'i faith for an hour. Evening worship here at 6.30 and then 8 o'clock. Deacon Sue is going to rock your world with some compliment. So lots of great options for worship tomorrow. Prayers for those of you that are traveling. And I hope you have a blessed evening.